Hello, my beautiful friend. Welcome to the Meant to Bloom podcast, where we talk real life motherhood struggles and simple steps to a brighter, more abundant life and mind. I'm here to walk with you on this journey to the life you're meant to be living, full of peace, joy, and love. I'm your host, Brittany Clarkson, and it's time to see the world through rose-colored glasses. Let's make this shift happen. After nearly two decades of having my life affected by depression, we talked about this in the last episode, in episode number 120, um, that I have had depression in my life for almost 19 years, nearly two decades now. I got diagnosed 13 years ago and actually found treatments that are long lasting and seen effective change in my life by changing my lifestyle and my mindset three years ago. Um, and it blows my mind how different life is now. Uh, but I've recently taken to researching depression in a new way. Originally, when I found out I was depressed, and then again, when I got serious about getting, you know, fixing it, uh, you know, healing those broken pieces, what felt so broken and, um, you know, getting my life together. When that all happened, I did a lot of research trying to learn how to treat depression. And I wasn't taking the time to understand it. Um, and as a side effect of that, uh, or a consequence of that, I learned a lot of ways to treat it, but I never knew that there was no cure. So when it started coming back in, I would start to feel really guilty that I was feeling depressed again. And last week I really called you to action and saying, get over that guilt. Don't hold on to the guilt that you can't shake depression for life because you're not meant to. And I want to dive into that again a little bit today and some of the other things I found out because that was mind blowing to me to find out that after having it for nearly 20 years, familiarizing myself with it in so many different ways, I didn't know there was no cure. I thought you could get rid of it. Turns out like when you have chronic long-term mental illness, there isn't a cure to it. That is just how your brain works, which got me questioning that sounds a lot like, you know, ADHD. There's no cure to ADHD. You simply find treatments and different ways of changing your lifestyle and working with it instead of against it. And I think we do the same thing to depression, which got me questioning, is depression neurodivergent? Is, is someone with chronic long-term depression, someone who cannot shake it, someone who, you know, gets rid of it and then it comes back kind of thing, um, recurring episodes. Is this neurodiver a neurodiverse condition? That's a little bit controversial right now, uh, but I am finding more and more articles saying, yeah, they're really starting to consider depression, long-term depression, um, neurodivergent. So that got me questioning, is it something we should be trying to get rid of? Or is it something that we should be learning to work with? Because here's one other thing is I had a friend who went in to get ADHD medication and after getting the medication or after meeting with her doctor, he determined that um, he was not going to give her ADHD medications um, because he instead prescribed her an antidepressant. Turns out she was having symptoms of depression that mimic and mirror and Im imitate ADHD. There's a lot of things that overlap in these two conditions. And apparently, according to this doctor and some others too, um, ADHD or depression has recently been misdiagnosed as ADHD a lot of the times. And it doesn't help that sometimes a lot of people have both. Uh, same thing, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, like a lot of people on the neurodiverse uh, side of things uh, tend to also have depression alongside it. People with ADHD tend to have depression. People with autism tend to be more prone to, uh, to depression. Um, just like when you have depression, you're also more prone to anxiety. These things all go hand in hand. And I think a lot of it is just the way our brain processes things and the way that we are addicted to stress and the way that we are able to manage stress. And I think a lot of it also goes into the mindset behind it. If you don't heal your mindset, it doesn't matter what you do. It's not going to heal the depression. It's not going to, you know, make the depressed part of it go away. And here was another mind-blowing thing I found in my studies here. And I'm talking studies from Psychology Today and VeryWellMind.com. Um, like I'm looking right now at VeryWellMind.com, listing depression and anxiety 
uh, borderline personality disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar disorder, all of those chronic mental illnesses as a neurodiverse condition. Um, so that's out there. Uh, but to discover that is kind of a little bit mind blowing. Um, so there is no cure, but also do we need to cure it? This was the other thing that I found fascinating that is new in my studies and something that I am experiencing in my life currently is I have felt a lot of the symptoms and patterns of a depressive episode without the sadness. And I think it's because I totally shifted my mindset. I see the world totally differently than I used to. I see myself differently than I used to. I am not this nervous wreck mess who hates myself. When I learned self-love and I learned self-respect and I learned self-worth, now if a depressive episode comes in, it feels really different. Like, yeah, it comes with anxiety. It comes with low motivation. It feels a lot more like I could confuse this for ADHD because classically we tend to think depression means you're sad but that's only one symptom. There's, you know, 10 different criteria that they say, if you have, you know, two or more of these, you are likely to have depression. If you have two or more of these for two weeks, if you have five or more of these ones for two weeks or more, um, well, motivation is part of that, uh, weight gain, weight loss, change in appetite, change in sleep patterns. Um, a lot of those things are, you, you can have depression, by putting together different pieces, you can still have a depressive episode occurring without feeling sad, without feeling like you need to end your life and you know find an escape route. So if we can experience depression without the sadness, can we see depression as a good thing? Can we see it as beneficial? Can we see it as a superpower? I've seen that so many times now, people who are embracing their neurodivergent in all these other areas it with the autism with the ADHD and saying you know what this can be my superpower it means I might not be good at these couple things over here that are my symptoms my side effects but also it means I can hyper focus in different areas it means I can be really good at something else is depression the same people who are suffering suffering afflicted with depression you can, you can hone in and you can really focus on something. You can make super logical decisions by separating yourself from feelings because you've gotten so good at separating yourself from feelings. Dude, that's awesome. It did break apart. My kid just lost a tooth. Oh, he's shy. Bye, bud. Stick it under your pillow. Um, we get a visit from the tooth fairy tonight. I better go collect some, uh, yeah, segue. My kid interrupted. Um, I'm gonna have to go collect some trinkets to trade him for his tooth. Uh, we like to, we don't give big money for, uh, for tooth, for teeth around here. Um, I play a real fairy role in that. And, you know, fairies, the fae are notorious for like, if you leave something in the window, they'll trade you for something else. Um, I've tried to get him to leave his tooth in the window instead of under his pillow, but he keeps putting it under his pillow and then he loses them. So I don't know where his teeth are going. I have not collected teeth. <laughs> I think I have the one that he had pulled and I have like his first tooth he lost, but every other tooth he's lost since then he's actually like lost the tooth. He doesn't know where it went. So <laughs> that's fun. Um, there's random teeth everywhere around apparently. Um, but anyways, can we look at depression? as a good thing, as a superpower. If you have the ability to make analytical decisions, very logic-based decisions, instead of feelings-based decisions, because you're used to having those negative feelings, the scary feelings, you're used to, you're used to numbing out your feelings and just looking at what is. That can be a superpower. And I encourage you to go research like the benefits of depression, because there's some really great articles I'm seeing out there that are diving into that and talking about that. And I want you to think about if you have depression in your life, even if you just have like chronic burnout, which might actually be depression. Um, but I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a psychologist. Um, I cannot diagnose you with these things, but I can inspire your creativity. I can inspire your, uh, questioning of your reality. Um, and I want you to question, are these things that you think are negative about your life? Are they actually just your superpower? Is this actually just a 
different way of looking at things that can be beneficial? Can you manipulate the way you're thinking just a little bit to make it positive? Because so often when we have depression, we are we are like hyper focusing on uh, it's rumination. We are ruminating, um, getting obsessed with a thought. We're really good at ruminating when we have depression. We're really good at thinking about something for a long period of time. The sad thing is too often we're thinking about our own faults and our own downfalls and the, you know, our own lack of worth and, you know, how we feel about ourselves. And we're, we're ruminating on these negative thoughts about ourselves. But what if you ruminated on something that could change the world? What if you shifted that obsession with how much you can't stand yourself and you shifted it with what you can do instead? There's so, there's so much to be discovered here. And honestly, like if I were a betting woman, um, which I mean, I guess at the roulette table, I am. Yeah, I have this. Yeah, we shouldn't talk about that. Um, sorry. I think I'm really good at roulette, which is what terrifies me. <laughs> I'm, I, I don't go into casinos unattended because I, I have a belief that I am really good at playing roulette, which is totally a game of chance. Uh, but my brain likes to think that I, I get to have, tap into intuition and predict what numbers are coming up at the table. Uh, and I make a lot of money, that way. <laughs> which is why I don't go to casinos more than once every five years. <laughs> um, anyways, self-control keeping yourself from situations that um, you know you could be weak in. And yeah, we just, we avoid those situations. Um, I don't know why I brought that up. I lost my train of thought. Okay. Um, This is what it's like to have an actual cup of coffee with me if we're having a conversation, by the way. Um, And I want, I'm not going to cut all this out because I want you to feel like we're friends and like we're having coffee together. Um, I don't want you to see me as this professional voice in the world. Uh, I've tried to play that card a little bit and I don't want to do that anymore. It's just like, if I shy away from my authenticity and who I am, what's that say that you should do with yours, right? Embrace who you are, embrace your quirks, embrace the weirdness, embrace what can be seen as mistakes and brokenness and downfalls and just be who you are, right? You are you for a reason. And that is really powerful and really beautiful. And to see you step into that, that is my, my joy and my delight is, is to see you guys step into who you are and to stop being ashamed of it and stop trying to fit into this mold that you were never meant to fit into. Right? So yeah. Can your depressive patterns and thoughts and things be a superpower? Can we see depression as neurodivergent? What I was going to say, I got sidetracked, my goodness. Okay, I remember now. What I could see happening in the next five to 10 years with the way that they are studying depression is I could see a whole new categorization coming out in the DSM-5 that meets the criteria of depression, puts an emphasis on sadness is optional, and is more for the chronic long-term depressed folk. You know, those of us who are just born with that genetic brain chemistry um, that is inclined towards what we see as depression. I could see us splitting the definitions of depression so that we then see, you know, you're depressed because of a tragic, um, a tragic event or a trauma or, you know, something happened. It's stress induced or pain, you know, trauma induced depressive episode versus you have the chronic mental illness of depression. You have a hard time shaking this. Can we learn to live with it? Um, Can we find long-term treatments that don't just mask what's going on with you, but actually teach you in a way to, to live joyfully as a depressed person, right? Um, I could see a new name coming out for it. That doesn't, you know, technically mean that you are sad because depressed really means sad and you can be you you can have depressed mental state without actually being sad in your mental state and in your mentality um and i could really see them coming out with the way they're researching this with a new uh more neurodivergent focused 
base criteria and name and all of that because the the DSM-5, this is, I'm talking about DSM-5, like you know what that is. Um, I'm pretty sure it's DSM-5. DSM, the um, Diagnostic Criteria for Mental Conditions. Um, that's what it is. It's the big book of all of the criteria that tell you what mental condition you have, um, basically. And they change it every few years or so. Um, I don't know how often they change it. It might not be every few years. It might be every 10, 20, 30, 40, but things change over time. Um, and I, I could see new studies in depression bringing a change to that conversation, to that diagnosis. Um, and I'd really love to see that actually. I really would. Um, I also wanted to talk today about creating a new survival mode. Pretty often we go in, we get, we get into burnout or we get really overwhelmed or we get a depressive episode and we go into survival mode. And really, really often that survival mode is just us turning off and going into autopilot. And what I have witnessed in myself in autopilot is that sometimes I'm doing things that, that are not, um, like I'm not actually doing things the best way that I could be. I'm not saving time with the way I'm doing things. I'm just doing them without thinking about it. And sometimes we get into survival mode and we start prioritizing the wrong things just because it's it's out of habit or we just assume this is what other people want us to do. So we focus on that instead of having conversations and having reflection time and setting real intentions for how we want to spend our time and how we want to prior prioritize our days. And I really do want to encourage you if you're going through survival mode or, you know, if you know that you'll be in survival mode again someday, I go into survival mode pretty often. We don't want to stay there for too long. That's when we start like thinking that we're this hot mess mom and we just can't get our life together because we've just been in survival mode from having a newborn child and we didn't exit that mode, right? I've heard so many different influencers talking about like, it's time to exit survival mode. It's time to level up. It's time to, you know, personal growth time. It's time to actually get your life together. Um, but I don't really see a lot of people talking about how survival mode could be the best time of your life. <laughs> like, honestly, if you are in survival mode, if you are overwhelmed or burnt out, or just there's so much going on, all of that, if you're feeling like your whole life is a mess, that is such a beautiful time. Okay. Survival mode can be easy because you've already determined that you don't have time for everything. So now if you just bring intent, bring intention into that conversation, if you say, what's actually important for me to do right now with my limited energy, my limited focus, my limited motivation, um, what, what do I actually need to focus on? And it might mean letting go of a lot of things around the house. It might mean not getting neurotic about your cleaning. It might mean making dinners as simple as possible. It might mean repeating the same dinner every night for a week. It might mean just making everything as simple as possible, passing on and delegating tasks. It might mean letting go of a lot of things and letting go is so beautiful. And the fall is just a wonderful time for this because the trees are reminding us, right? That quote's going all over social media right now. The trees are about to remind us how beautiful it is to let things go. Let go. Even like we talk a lot about letting go of what's not working for you, what's not serving you, letting go of, you know, what, what is broken, what is, you know, what is wasting your time. But also these, these leaves on these trees, they're green and lush and beautiful, but those trees are going to let them die and let them drop anyway, so that it can do the work it needs to bloom more beautifully again next year. Otherwise, if a tree just tried to stay in bloom all year long, it would die. Same, right? Same. We can't try to stay in bloom all the time. We have to winter. We have to shed our leaves in the fall. And that's survival mode. Dropping down to the bare minimum, hibernating, right? Like my kid's got a hamster and I'm pretty sure hamsters, I read that hamsters hibernate and it looks like her patterns are that of hibernation. She's storing her food in her house. She's slowing down. She's like taking really long naps. She's not using a lot of her energy. Um, and that's what hibernation is. It doesn't mean sleeping for six months. It means reducing your energy so that like, like they store up their fat and then, 
you know, like when a bear goes in a cave, it doesn't sleep for, for that whole much of time. Um, if a bear was sleeping the whole time it was in a cave, hibernating, it wouldn't come out with a baby in the spring. Um, but they are reducing their energy. They're doing the bare minimum so that they're not burning off all their calories so that they don't need to eat more. Um, so do that, hibernate, go into survival mode intentionally and know, Hey, what's important to spend my energy on right now? What needs to get done? And what can I let go? And one great way I think to look at that is um, setting up a bare minimum for every day and just being like, these are like the three things I need to keep doing. And if I do these three, then I know that nothing else has to get done. Everything else can get done when I start getting dopamine again. Everything else can get done when I have more time. Everything else can get done when I feel good enough to do it without beating myself up about it, right? Um, everything else can wait until I can do it without doing it perfectly, right? Um, sometimes perfection causes a lot of procrastination because we're not going to do it until we're ready to do it perfect. Maybe don't do it until you're ready to do it imperfect. Ever think of that? Um, but survival mode can be a really great, re really beautiful time. Um, this can be your wintering. This can be when you feel like everything is just too much. Everything is too heavy. Everything is getting dark. Everything, you're just covered in crap. Um, I like to think of that as a seed being buried. A seed has to be buried in the darkness. It has to be deprived of light. It has to be, you know, drenched in the rain. It has to be covered in manure um, before it can bloom to its best ability, you know? It's got to put down those roots. It's got to take that time where no one sees growth before it can start growing. Um, and you are the same. We mimic nature. Humans mimic nature in so many ways. I think it's really beautiful. And I think our mindset needs to grasp that. The, you know, we're not meant to work every single day, nine to five, five days a week, and have every day look the same going on and on and on, especially as women, because we have a cycle our energy peaks at different times of the month and it dips at different times of the month. So you could take a lot of what we're talking about depression wise and talk about our hormonal cycles and see that as a whole, like, Hey, your brain works differently at different times of the month. Your motivation levels are different at different times of the month. Stop resisting it and work with it. Let it be a beautiful thing. Let it guide you towards the life you're meant to be living. Um, stop fighting who you are, right? So my beautiful friend, that's really what I had to talk to you today. Think about things differently. See things differently. When you see something as a negative, maybe it's not. Okay. I love you so much, my beautiful friend. Um, I do want to encourage you to go to my Etsy shop because the Happy Mom Brain printable version is on super, super sale right now. So meant to bloom .com .etsy, or meant to bloom .etsy .com. It'll be linked in the show notes. Um, and you can find it there for a limited time. It will be coming down and expiring later this month. I'm actually looking up the exact date in case you're listening to this later. It will be expiring on October 14th. So you can get in by October 14th and get the Happy Mom Brain principle for a super cheap, super low price. If you want the physical book, it's this thing right here. Um, it's a workbook full of, exactly, it's my mental health toolkit. It's how I started recovering from constant depressive episodes that were leading me to, you know, nearly end my life time and time again. And this is how I really shifted and changed. And it's the base layer, how I started living the life that I am meant to be living, um, how I opened my mind to my own potential and my own worth and my own, you know, I don't know. I want to say greatness. I'll say greatness. You should say it too. You are great. You are wonderful. You are beautiful. You are awesome. Um, compliment yourself and own it. Stop shying away from, from positive self-talk, right? Let's do that. Uh, but that's always available on Amazon, available on Amazon. Um, if you just Google or Amazon, uh, search happy mom brain or Brittany Clarkson, you will find that. Um, and always it is linked in the show notes as well. Uh, 
that's it. I love you so much, my friend. Thanks for being here. Till next time.